Today is Sunday, November 20th, 2022, and this is Flashpoint. Hi, welcome to Flashpoint. I hope everything is off to a good start around your place this Sunday. A big, big week ahead in Detroit. Thanksgiving is just about here, which means the great tradition of America's Thanksgiving parade is ready to make its annual march down Woodward Avenue. We are thrilled, as always, to be your home for one of Detroit's signature events, and we invite you to be a part of it either in person or watching from wherever you may be on the air, online, and streaming on Local 4+. Plus. But before we get to Thursday, plenty on tap this morning. Changes coming in Washington as the Republicans take over the House, and they've already got a laundry list of investigations they'd like to launch. For the first time in two decades, House Democrats won't be taking their marching orders from Nancy Pelosi. And yet there aren't as many changes coming as Republicans had hoped as they continue the autopsy on the midterm elections. It's a particularly acute inquiry just now with Donald Trump announcing he will run for the presidency again in 2024. This morning, we're going to talk with Michigan Senator Gary Peters. He's the head of the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee, which looked like a lousy job going into the midterms. But Peters is being hailed as the chief strategist that kept the red wave at bay. We're also going to get to two important topics away from politics. First, a nasty intersection of illness could be setting in. We've already got pediatric care units packed with RSV cases, and here comes flu season, and with what many fear will be a new surge of COVID cases. Also on the health front, there is a shortage right now of the drug Adderall. The ADHD drug is in high demand. What are we to make of both the shortage and that demand? It's all today on Flashpoint. All right, we're going to start this morning with a conversation with Michigan Senator Gary Peters, who found out, uh, of course, pretty quickly that he was going to remain among the majority in the U.S. Senate. Uh, but he's also now being hailed as the architect of, depending on your point of view, the Democrats' success or the Republicans' failure uh, during the midterm elections. Good to have Gary Peters, the senator, uh, back with me again on Flashpoint. Senator, I appreciate your time. I want to get to all of that on the midterms first. Let's start, though, with the news of the week. We found out that uh, well, Donald Trump is is going to run again uh, for president, starting the the uh, the clock on that very early. We found out that the Democrats uh, have lost the House, and we also find that there are all of a sudden a lot of investigations planned uh, by the Republicans. Kind of tell me what you think this past week has told us about what's ahead. Well, I, I hope we're going to be able to to work together. As you mentioned, uh, we have the majority uh, in in the Senate. We're hoping to expand that majority by one seat after the Georgia runoff coming up on uh, December six. So you're going to have a Republican controlled House and a Republican and a Democratic controlled Senate. Uh, and I hope that we're focused on solving the tough problems that we're facing as a country, and that we can come together and work in a bipartisan way. We've been able to do that the last uh, two years uh, with our bipartisan infrastructure package. We were able to pass the CHIPS Act dealing with semiconductors and critically important issue for us here in Michigan and the auto industry. We've been able to come together. Uh, and I would hope uh, the majority that we're seeing in the House of Republicans are, are willing to roll up their sleeves and work on some issues so we can show that we can get things done for the American people together. I, I guess that's kind of where my question was was going. Can we get all of that? Can we get progress if now that uh, the Republicans feel, I think, that uh, they're, they're acting in kind, that the there was just a continuous flood of investigations being launched against, against them, and, and how much progress can you have against this backdrop of, uh, you think you're going to investigate me, I'm going to investigate you. Well, certainly the, the, the House uh, had their January 6 uh, investigation, but while that was going on, we were still getting things done. The bipartisan legislation uh, that I mentioned, we were able to get that done during that time. So uh, I'm still hopeful. I believe that we have to, to get that done. I think that's the lesson, uh, to be quite frankly, uh, in this election where we saw voters coming out and looking at candidate quality. That's how we won the Senate, uh, is that there was a very, very clear gulf between our candidates versus the Republicans, our candidates with a track record of getting things done versus Republican candidates who were quite frankly, very extreme on the issues. They were election deniers. They took extreme positions on the abortion issue. Uh, and I think we saw that most Americans are saying enough of all that. Let's find some common ground and let's get some things done. 
you're the you're the chair of the Democratic Senatorial uh, Campaign Committee, which I got to be honest, didn't sound like the best job in the world to have about a year ago. Um, a, a lot of things uh, changed in that time, but I'm I, and you, uh, as I said, have been accredited with helping put together this strategy. But I'm curious to ask you, what do you think would have happened had abortion not been uh, 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 as prominent a factor uh, this go round as it was? Well, there's no question it was a, a powerful factor, and it certainly motivated a lot of turnout. It certainly energized the Democratic uh, base in a significant way. And, you know, ab abortion's always been an important issue in these in elections in the past. The difference being that with Roe v. Wade, folks who were pro-choice figured there was always Roe versus Wade. There wasn't, uh, wasn't a real threat. Clearly, it was a threat once the Supreme Court overturned a half a century of legal uh, precedent that uh, people knew that it was on the ballot. It's what we saw here in Michigan. Prop 3 had a major uh, impact on turning folks out, particularly young voters. And, it, you know, it's interesting. We had one of the highest levels of young voter registration in this election, one of the highest in the country. The other state that had a real big surge uh, was Kansas, which also had a referendum uh, on the abortion issue as well. So clearly it brought uh, uh, voters uh, who wouldn't have voted otherwise, perhaps. Uh, but I think we still would have, these would have been close races regardless. And and that's what, when I knew getting into this as the DS chair and uh, that all of these were close races, they're in battleground states, our Senate races are battlegrounds. By definition, a battleground state is very close in every election. So that shouldn't have been a surprise. So when you had all that talk about all these races are getting tight, they're getting close. I, I said to people, I would have told you that two years ago, they're going to be close. Uh, and that's why uh, we also built an incredibly strong and powerful ground campaign in each of these campaigns and that was uh, another difference for us you know you have uh, built a reputation for being one of the more um, bipartisan senators around eager to work across the aisle i'm curious if the headlines about you now and the work that you did on this campaign does that change your uh id card in, in the u.s senate now as somebody who's tried to work across the aisle does it raise suspicion now about uh, about that among uh, among the republicans well I, I don't think so i'm still the same guy that i was uh, uh before and i'll be the same guy going forward and, and it's about getting things done as i said in our opening comments here in this segment i hope we work in a bipartisan way i believe that's how you get the the best uh, solutions to the problems uh, that uh, we are facing. Uh, a lot of the campaigns that we were engaged in, I mean, our candidates were running as problem solvers. They were running as common sense problem solvers. And I think that's where the majority of American people want. I find that most folks, uh, there are, we have extremes on both sides of the party, but we have a lot of people in the center. They, they are center left, they're center right. But what they really look for is someone who wants to get things uh, done. And when you have a contrast, and, and this, this election, was about a choice of the senator you wanted in your state. And when you have a contrast to someone who's trying to get things done, has a track record of getting things done and brings people together versus a candidate that's very extreme on a number of issues, that's what uh, I think that's uh, why we were so successful in our races and why we'll be successful in Georgia as well. Which tees up uh, my next question, because last week on the program, I talked about how I, I think in many elections, the winning side misreads the mandate or sees a mandate where one doesn't necessarily exist. We know that a lot of voters these days uh, head to the polls and vote against something rather than for something. And I, I get what do you feel like your marching orders are from the American people right now? Uh, was it against the kind of uh, you talked about, for, for example, election denialism, uh, abortion positions, or was it for what the Democrats stand for? Well, I think uh, it, there's a lot of elements. I think four was part of that because there was also very clear contrast. And I'll just give you one contrast. It was very clear. It was very powerful in our elections uh, as well with our incumbents that we've been able to deliver uh, deliver on, on on issues that are important to people. So in, in the summer, we passed the Inflation Reduction Act. We're dealing with inflation in this country. We've got to deal with it. It's inflation all over the world. The Europeans have higher inflation than we do. It's a huge problem. But who's actually dealing with it? Who, there, there are people who identify it's a problem. We already know it's a problem. That's not uh, earth shattering. And we've got to figure out solutions. And in our in, in, um, Inflation Reduction Act, we passed legislation to allow Medicare to negotiate with drug companies to lower the price of prescription drugs. And that is a very popular thing. And yet not one Republican voted to lower the price of prescription drug for seniors and Democrats did. It was a clear contrast for folks and it's about getting things done. So uh, that's an important part of the election as well. We shouldn't just look at one aspect of it. Winning elections, there are many pieces to it. 
uh, and all of them play in a, in a complex way sometimes, but all of that is part of that narrative. Who do you want to get things done? Who can you trust to find common ground? Who's gonna stand up for you? And then, uh, then the mechanics of our campaign are making sure those people who wanna vote Democratic actually get to the polls. Senator Gary Peters, it is always good to have you on the program. I know we'll have uh, you continue, I assume, with your chairmanship of the Homeland Security Committee. Uh, so I know we will be talking to you again soon and in the future. Happy Thanksgiving and thanks very much for the time. Happy Thanksgiving to you and your family as well and uh, everybody viewing. Take you care. Thanks. All right, we'll continue with more. This is Flashpoint on Local 4. There are over 500 reasons to shop Black Friday at Gardner White. Reason number 166. We're Michigan's power reclining headquarters, and we've slashed prices on reclining sectionals, reclining sofas, and recliners. Save now at Gardner White. A progressive jackpot that grows with every play. That's what makes fast cash from the Michigan Lottery such a thrilling game. The progressive jackpot keeps building and building and building until jackpot. Fast cash. The fun keeps building. Hi, I'm Kathy from Independent Car for One in Westland, and if you need new flooring, you have to come see us. We have one of the largest showrooms and warehouses in Southeast Michigan, packed with the best floor coverings for any lifestyle or budget. We have a huge selection of carpet, laminate, hardwood, and vinyl flooring, along with custom area rugs. Take advantage of warehouse pricing and our certified installers who will ensure your floor is perfect. For over 50 years, Independent Carpet One has been the one store for your perfect floor. There are over 500 reasons to shop Black Friday at Gardner White. Reason number 11. We make it easy with 0% financing up to 88 months. Open and use your Gardner White credit card and get a free $100 Visa gift card. Only at Gardner White. We either have to leave right this second or we have to call an ambulance. It was scary. Local 4's Jason Colthorpe and his wife Ida open up about their baby's RSV scare. Feels like it just happened so fast. He almost couldn't breathe at all. And she's like, I just want to give you a heads up. We're turning the sirens on. We need to get him there fast. Within seconds, your entire life can change. So that other parents know what to look for and what to do. RSV hits home Monday at 545 on Local 4 News. Welcome back. I want to move now to this horrendously frightening intersection of illness uh, that is coming right around what we typically think of as flu season, but now complicated by two other factors, not only flu season, but we've already watched RSV really making things difficult on a lot of hospitals, but what happens with COVID as well. As I have so many times turning on, on this program, turning again to Dr. Jim Baker, the Ruth Dow Doan, a professor and immunologist from the U of M. Uh, this is a weird cocktail. Let's take them one at a time though. Let's start with RSV. This is a fairly common disease, but we don't see it break out like this. We, we think what happened was because people were isolated for the past couple of years, there was no real exposure. So in fact, there's- Meaning no immunity. No immunity, seeing it for the first time and, and more likely to spread the infection. And particularly with very young children, newborns and those, it can be very serious. Uh, in fact, as you'll see tomorrow on Local 4, my colleague here, Jason uh, Colthorpe and his wife Ida just went through this horrendous experience with their, at the time, six week old, uh, needing hospitalization for it. Everything's fine now, I'm happy to say. But these, the younger you are, the more likely this is to be perilous, right? Yes, and it causes a pneumonia that's very difficult to treat. Uh, they have some approaches, they have antibodies they can give. The good news is that there's a vaccine that's just shown efficacy. If they give it to the mother during pregnancy, it'll protect the child. So that, that's something in the future, but right now it's a difficult, difficult problem. Fascinating approach to vac vaccinate. I mean, it makes uh, all the sense in the world, especially given that you can't do very much to help inoculate or keep a, a newborn safe. No. Yeah, uh, let's let's talk about this. So we have already watched what that what is go, what that's doing to our hospitals. Uh, a lot of these uh, pediatric units are completely yeah. full. Emergency Children's room. hospitals Children's are ho packed. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's packed. Now we let's add a couple of complicating factors. What's the outlook for the flu this year? So the flu has been worse than we expected. It's, it's the same virus that we expect. So the, the vaccine's effective, but the problem is 
people haven't been exposed and they haven't been getting their flu shots because they've been focused on COVID. So in fact, we're getting a lot of infections and, and you know, people ask me, do I get the COVID shot or the flu shot? I'm actually telling them to get the flu shot immediately because that's what's really happening now. And if it comes down to one or the other, that they should get the flu first and then wait a couple of weeks and get the COVID. You wouldn't necessarily get them at the same time. Well, that's a very good question. There is some data that would suggest that they, they call it immune interference, where you give two things at once and the immune response to both is less. Mm. And there's some data around that with COVID and flu, but if it's between getting both of them at the same time and not getting one of them, I get both of them at the same when time. When you've got somebody ready and right. eager and on location, yeah, yeah, you hate to lose the, the opportunity there. Um, now let's add COVID to the mix, which we uh, everybody's just sort of expecting, uh, as we've seen in the past couple of years, to get a COVID surge as the weather changes. Do we have evidence of that yet? Or do we know what we have right now yeah, with COVID? Yeah, well, it's, it's becoming an enigma, and, and we aren't getting much of advice from the government, unfortunately. But what we've seen so far, not unexpectedly, there are new variants out there that appear different from the one that's even in the bi binary shot that they developed last spring. Um, the good news is that in places where that those variants are already out, they aren't seeing bad infections. They're seeing low infections. They aren't seeing severe hospitalizations or death like they did early on. Um, and there's some evidence that the, the booster vaccines will induce immunity to these new infections. But I think the bottom line is that that's almost a secondary issue. Most people, if they've gotten the vaccine, or in particular, if they were infected in the first half of the year, have some immunity to these yeah, viruses. Yeah. And you know, as they've shown numerous times, it's not going to keep people from getting infected. The real key is to keep them from getting sick and hospitalized. But, uh, so I'm in the information business. Every Tuesday, they release the numbers, and I feel like I'm reading uh, and, and assessing the COVID world right now with a blindfold on. We know that uh, uh, most cases are not being reported. People aren't even testing anymore. They get sick, and they may uh, assume it's, but we, I, I'm not sure we have a great hand on how many cases or what the spread is, am I right? I think you're right. And the other thing is that people have just sort of abandoned it. I came I'm in right. from the airport today, less than 5% of the people in the airport are wearing masks. Right. And the uptake of the binary vaccine has been very low. And I think part of this is the government's not really communicating the need to continue to worry about this and to protect yourself. And giving in to the COVID fatigue, which we know is everywhere. Absolutely, yeah. and they need they need to develop a plan moving forward the way they do with the flu. I mean, we have an annual booster every year and that's shown to be effective. We need to use sort of the best uh, evidence that we've gotten from this actual pandemic to decide how we're going to handle this long term. Are we going to vaccinate every year? Do we really need to? You know, do we need to mask? I think, I think right now we need to mask as much or more for flu as we do for COVID. It's interesting because the struggle through this whole thing has been not being able to get everybody on the same page at the same time, and that's where we are three years later. Right? Absolutely. Dr. Mayer, you did just come in from the airport. I so appreciate you coming in to be with us today. Always a pleasure. You Thank bet. you. We come back, we'll talk about another health matter, the uh, shortage of Adderall. This is Flashpoint, our local four. Save 40% off all the latest styles from Hooker. Furnishings for every room are on sale. That's 40% off bedrooms, dining rooms, and living rooms from fashion leader Hooker. Factory authorized discounts of 40% off Hooker at Gorman's. Inflation has made food too expensive for some families to afford. After paying for housing, paying for health care, paying for transportation, there may be very little money left for food. With food insecurities on the rise, Forgotten Harvest is there to answer the call. We're working to feed over 700,000 people this year. We want your support to feed our neighbors in need. Act now and show your support at ForgottenHarvest.org. And together, we can end hunger. Hurry and save 40, 50, even 60% off Michigan's best leather at Gorman's. All custom orders, 40 off. Most stock, 50 off. And 60% off all designer leather closeouts. Now exclusively at all Gorman's. 
Think as if it were you on the other side. If I see something good around the country, we're adopting it. It's, it's hard. We are really, really close to a tipping point. That is astronomically insane. Solutionaries, the creative thinkers and doers working to make the world a better place. Subscribe at youtube.com slash solutionaries. Welcome back. The news that there is an Adderall shortage may have struck you as not particularly riveting, but there is a massive story beneath that shortage that tells us quite a bit about American mental health and its remedies. Very happy to have with me Dr. Asha Shahjahan, who is the medical director for community health for Beaumont Health System. Doctor, really good to have you here. Thanks for having me, Devin. I, I was telling you before we started that when you first read that headline, Adderall shortage, it, it is so laden with what it really means and what it's telling us about where America is right now, or am I overselling that? No, I think, you know, ADHD, attention deficit disorder, is a serious illness, and a lot of people have it. And if you don't have the right medications to treat it, it can cause a lot of problems for individuals. We also, though, know that it is a terribly abused drug. There's an awful lot of people who are, in fact, famously the former Speaker of the House, Lee Chatfield, among the uh, litany of accusations against him was that there was some trade going on of Adderall. There's a lot of people who, for whom it has not been prescribed, but who still really want it. What is that about? So it is a controlled substance, so it's a, considered a scheduled drug, and so therefore it's regulated because it can have addicting properties to it. So it depends. Like, for example, if you really need the medication, think about um, Adderall or any type of stimulant medication for ADHD being like mm, glasses for the mind. And so if you put glasses on your mind, you can see clearer, you can focus better that type of thing. If you don't need glasses and you're wearing glasses, it's not very helpful to you and can be harmful even. But if you need them, it really helps you focus and see clearly. It's a really good way of putting it. I think too though that some people, it's, it's a little confusing because when you think of somebody who's ADHD, the H in there is hyperactivity. A stimulant wouldn't seem to be what somebody needs, yes. but it stimulates uh, the brain to work in a different way. Absolutely. So it actually works on your neurotransmitters of the brain that increases the dopamine and the norepinephrine. And so you need that to be able to focus better. It works on the prefrontal cortex of the brain. The people who are abusing it, though, and, and I assume that that's part of what's helping lead to the shortage, is people who don't uh, haven't been prescribed it but still want it, what do they want from it? What are they getting from it? So again, it is a, it's a medication that can, you can get a high from. You can abuse it. It's just because it's a, basically an amphetamine. And so it, people do use it to get high. And, but most of the people that are getting it from their physicians, that hence the shortage, they're getting it prescribed. And so, but still, there is an actual shortage going on for especially the people that need it. We, I've also heard that it, 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 there are some people that seem to believe that it helps them lose weight. Is there it, something to that? It can because it is a stimulant medication. So any stimulant can, can possibly help you do that. So what is going on that we have now a shortage of it? Is it there's so many people need it and want it? Or is it like everything else and we've got supply chain issues? So I think it's a combination. So I think right now there is a supply chain issue in terms of um, the major corporation that creates this medication, that they did not have enough workers to cr uh, actually make the packaging for the medication. And then the second thing is that there has been a lot more prescribing going on. And I think the reason why is from the pandemic, we've seen an increase in the number of ADHD um, diagnoses as well. So there is more prescribing happening, so there's more demand, but then there's also a supply chain issue. What do you think is going on there that we've seen a jump in these diagnoses? Does it tell us something about COVID and about the pandemic and the way that we've all had to respond to it or is something else going on? Yeah, so I think the thing is, is that the pandemic has been so stressful for everybody. And so in stressful moments and you're multitasking, you're trying to do more things, you're having a harder time focusing. I think there's been a lot of education on ADHD. And so many adults who maybe were not um, diagnosed as a child have learned about ADHD and are thinking, you know, yeah. maybe I am, maybe I do have ADHD and I might need help, see their doctor and then decide if that's and appropriate. This, this is where that Adderall story, I said it kind of, uh, it kind of hid a much larger story and this is part of it. The mental health of America, I guess I would say the whole world right now, but we'll focus on America coming out of the pandemic is still very, very fraught, especially with young people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the amount of anxiety and depression that I'm seeing in the office is, is incremental like it, it's just it's very, it's very difficult actually to go to work sometimes because you see so much anxiety you see so much depression going from all the way from being young 
uh, all the way to being older, to being a geriatric um, person who's lonely, to a young kid that's getting bullied in school. I mean, the stress and the amount of anxiety and depression in our society is, I think, an unprecedented amount. I know a number of uh, counselors, people who specialize in young people, who cannot take new patients anymore. Uh, that's another part of this crisis right now, so much need and not a whole lot of slots left. Yeah, I think this is where, like, me as a primary care provider is, is very helpful because we're able to bridge people in between the, the opportunity of being able to see a psychiatrist or a therapist. There is a huge wait right now because there is a big demand. Um, but you can still see your primary care physician to be able to see if you might qualify for medication or for counseling or therapy. It, 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 it's interesting because we talk a lot about um, law enforcement people not really being equipped to be the first line of mental health defense. I would say a lot of parents aren't sure that they're always equipped with the best answers. They don't always know exactly what they're seeing. They know their kids better than anybody else, but they don't always know the best way to help, maybe. Yeah, so I think that's the thing when you can, if you are starting to notice behaviors that are difficult, your child's withdrawn, having difficulty concentrating, maybe not doing as well in school. So changes. Yeah, changes in their normal behavior, their routine. That's when you might want to have a conversation with their doctor and also your doctor about what can I do uh, to help support my child better. It's a lot to think about, and I, I fear it's only going to continue to worsen here as uh, we keep finding the fallout of, of the pandemic. Doctor, thank you so much for coming in. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Yep, you bet. Uh, quick reminder, of course, it is a big day coming up on Thursday. Uh, the parade coming up live from Woodward Avenue. We certainly hope you will, as so many do, join us for Thanksgiving morning in Detroit. We will see you then. That's it for Flashpoint. Meet the Press coming up next. Have a great week.